Good day, folks. I'd like to talk to you today about my efficient displacement current generator concept. I've been working a lot with the Maxwell extended equations and with the solve the unknowns lately. But I understand it's one thing, right, to have the math. And a lot of people, when they just have the math, they don't quite understand the interactions. So my work has been trying to figure out ways, like practical meanings to these interactions and what we can do and what it supports. So I've been pretty busy with a lot of theory in that. And some people sometimes have been scrutinizing, saying theory is one thing, but you know, you got to get into the application. So one thing at a time, right? So now it's to figure out, you know, block diagrams and schematics and interactions. So the general idea anyways, and this brings me to, you know, splitting the positive concepts. And there have been numerous talks about it, but just a paragraph or two or a few block diagrams, never much explanation into the mechanism. So taking that into consideration and the new interactions I found out, I started thinking and figuring out ways to make this work. So basically, this might be revelations as well to what Don Smith was doing. So essentially what happens, and again, Bedini was right, folks, because we're essentially running electricity completely backwards, okay? So let me explain. In traditional circuits, we use, you know, the um, power is dependent mostly on the uh, current flow, right? So between a closed loop system. And we depend on the movement of current. More current means more power, obviously. So we push current through the load, right? Now what happens is if we reverse, and that's all we need to do is reverse the role. So and essentially what you want to do, folks, is you want to use, you want to take the pure potential. So you want voltage to do the work of current and current to do the work of voltage. If you literally flip the roles, you get a much more efficient, I guess a transformer would be the um, term for it. So I've got a circuit here, so I'm going to bring up the diagram, and I will have that in the PDF link for you so you can follow along with the detailed explanations because lately I've been running out of room on YouTube, folks, to be able to actually um, write all the interactions in detail, so I've been putting it all on a PDF for those who are interested. I would recommend reading that because it really does reveal what this thing does, and it's very advanced but very practical. So I'm going to start looking at it here. So basically what we have is a dual channel, again, fully isolated uh, square wave switching mechanism. That could be whatever you want. So we're going to have to essentially engineer that. But that's not the end of the world. There's various configurations. We could use a few H-bridge MOSFETs. There's other ways of doing it. But essentially you're going to have a switching mechanism. And it's going to have an A and B channel, 180 degrees out of phase. So when one is on, the other one is off, essentially. So looking at the diagram here, we want to take advantage of pure potential without using any current or very little current. So what we're going to do is going to use the switch to first charge a capacitor on the primary side of a transformer. But the thing is, it's not connecting through the transformer during the first part of the cycle. It's actually charging through the DC voltage source. So the first half of the cycle charges the capacitor, and then the second half of the cycle, the channel releases the capacitor's energy into the primary of the coil. This saturates our coil with mostly pure potential. So we use the peg cell here to limit the current, but instead of just using it as a regular resistor where it would also regulate and drop a significant portion of the potential using the peg cell because of its pure electrostatic potential that it has it also acts as like a regular in series dc cell so what it does is will actually contribute to a little bit of that pure potential instead of taking it away but through the natural current limiting through its natural electrostatic potential essentially like a series dc circuit where the weakest cell determines the total current distribution across the whole closed loop so we're actually taking advantage of this instead of using it as a disadvantage and the peg cell actually tops up some of our potential so the neon lamp is simply to add a very minimal load so we can saturate the core during the on time now the secondary is just a regular high voltage secondary now i've been doing a lot of calculations folks and unfortunately, which is not really unfortunately, but it's just part of the game. If we're going to try and convert pure potential into a form of um, 
power, we need to use very high potential so we can trigger a displacement current between a, a lower and a higher. And it's the higher the potential, the more efficient this system becomes. But unfortunately, once you get into the very high voltage stuff, like anything over 20 kilovolts or more, it, especially when you get into the 100 kilovolts, you start getting some undesired effects like skin effect and all these extra um, mechanisms that you have to incorporate. And it becomes more complicated and more costly and more complicated to isolate. So that's where Don Smith used several mechanisms like an ion valve to take advantage of the skin effect but concentrate it only where he wanted it and use that to ionize the air and you'd use that as an additional energy system. But that becomes advanced. You don't need to go that far. I wanted to see what I can get that's practical that essentially will light up a light bulb. And to be able to do this, the minimum is 10 to 20 kilovolts. And I will explain that. Now, as you see here, we introduce a vacuum capacitor on the secondary side. This allows us to bring up our reactive gains. So we tune the secondary side and it also offers a power correction factor because we're dealing with coils. So um, this is an area where power correction can really make a big difference, as I've shown in a previous video just a few um, days ago here with a microwave fan, how it made such a difference just by having the right capacitors. Fortunately, I fluked it, you know, without having to calculate it. I just took a few capacitors and it ended up being a compatible value and the motor spun much faster than just plugged in directly into the inverter. So we want to simulate that. So whatever we can do to bring up the potential. But now, as you notice, and people talk about this, reactive gains are great reactive VAR power, but people realize that once you try and load it down, boom, you lose those gains right away. But we're not using traditional current in the traditional sense. We want to use it just as a pure potential trigger. One thing we've learned in all of this experimentation is that reactive power may not be able to, to, to run a traditional loads, especially if you've got gain to resonance, but it will have no problems charging those capacitors. It loves to charge capacitors. So you know what, folks? Let's use it to charge our capacitor to very high voltage to take advantage of the pure potential. Now we have a common ground that um, the both of the capacitors connect to, and on each side we close the loop through a the peg cell, which acts as potential and a very, very high resistor. Now, in order to make this work, and Tom Bearden was right, the key here is to add as much resistance as you can to the loop. You'll notice that once you get to about 9, 10 K, it will vary depending on the design. And the way to find out is once you get to a certain value, it's not going to matter anymore. And this is where Tom Bearden is right. If you have one or two or three or four more light bulbs in parallel with that output, it's always going to stay, let's say if it's 100 or 200 milliamp, it's not going to drop any more than that. So in other words, you can run all those lamps essentially for almost free if you understand the drift of what happens here. But you need to have that high resistance because if you have the low resistance, you end up working like a traditional closed loop. But a normal resistor will just bring the resistance down, give you some heat, and also drop the potential. Now, Don Smith mentioned a special kind of resistor. He didn't want to go into the details. We're using the peg cell for that because it gives you its natural abilities to drop the potential, but actually keep the potential, um, drop the current and keep and actually raise the potential. So you're boosting the potential and dropping the current, which is not very traditional, but we're going to take advantage of that as the peg cell properties. Now, what happens if you start doing the math, this is actually very, very traditional Ohm's law through the displacement current between the two potentials. If at 9K, let's say that our, and I'm being very generous here, it's probably going to be more than that, but let's say minimally speaking, it's about 10K. I know it's more, but let, let's just say it's 10K in traditional resistance, the peg cell. Well, at those values, if you put a 100 volt light bulb at 200 milliamps, which is about what you'd get here if this is all tuned right, that will have no problem driving a 60 watt light bulb, even a, a bit more than its traditional brightness. So you're getting a lot of power there for maybe milliamps in. So you understand that um, 
once the capacitor and the primary is charged because we're highly limiting the current it doesn't discharge at every pulse it's like a fraction of a percentage so your input power supply hardly has to work at every cycle to retop that capacitor because we're taking advantage of pure potential yet we're using maybe you still have to use a little bit in switching because we have our switch so let's say a quarter watt is running the whole thing and we're lighting up even beyond normal brightness 60 watt 100 volt light bulbs so you see in regular systems you wouldn't really think of doing this because um it's all in perspective right because let's say we would want to work with 20 kilovolts let's say that would be our native uh, voltages and we run we want to run let's say a 60 watt light bulb at that 20 kilovolts well if you include that 10k resistance and then that light bulb you'd only end up with a few volts it wouldn't be enough folks you see but if you work around, which just happens that in our mainstream mains is 100 volts, so it, an industrial standard, a lot of stuff is already designed at 100 volts. And what's very interesting is the higher you are in running voltages, the more efficient the system becomes. So it's a lot easier to run a 60-watt, uh, 100-volt light bulb than a 60-watt, 12-volt light bulb. So in a way, they are scamming us how they bring our, our, our voltages down for traditional household because we're actually wasting a lot of energy doing that. We should run everything at much higher potentials. It would be much more efficient. But anyways, the point for that is the efficiency here really matters. So now, as I was saying, it's relative to, to, to the system. So I was thinking, okay, so uh, let's try and calculate something that would work with mains. So let's, so I figured out the peg cell, let's say 10K plus the regular resistance of the light bulb. With all those calculations, this is where you get about 200 milliamps and it will drop massively because you see here you got 10 to 20 kilovolts. But with all that resistance with the lamp, it drops it down to only 160. So you're ending up with a fraction of the potential that you had to work with. But it doesn't matter because you've got 200 milliwatt, milliamps to work with at that voltage, which will give you the equivalent of your 60 watt or beyond lamp. So you see what I'm getting at here. Very efficient way. So, uh, unfortunately, I tried with different values, and if you start bringing it lower, you don't have enough voltage to pull off this trick, because we're using the, the displacement current between the potential difference of the two capacitors that always want to equalize, but because we're switching it, we're keeping those capacitors always top, so you always have that big... So you're not letting the system between the switching and the resistance to, to, to equalize as much as it wants to. And it's that slow drag that you're creating with the peg cell and the resistance that you're converting that back into real usable energy that at 100 volts is actually quite a lot. So the key here is very high potentials, reversing the role. So what we're doing here is we're using voltage to do the work of current through our circuits and getting power that way. Because displacement current is not traditional current but we're able to get the same kind of work done through it. Now, this is a simplified approach. I would say if you were like Bedini had different books, beginner, advanced, intermediate, and all that, I would consider this circuit here to be the intermediate version. And um, the super advanced would be, I wouldn't recommend this, but for openness, you could, instead of running a light and letting it drop it down to about 160 volts, you can spark gap this instead. Now, what do you do with that? I'm not sure at this point. Whatever your mind has, maybe some high capacitive spark discharge motor, maybe another stage you have in mind, a Don Smith kind of setup. This could be the driver stage for something much bigger if you want to go there. But I don't like spark gaps because they're noisy and whatnot. But, you know, how are you going to switch this high, you know? So you pretty well need a spark gap. But this is stepping into the Don Smith territory. Yes, you would have a potential for generating kilowatts of energy this way. But at the cost that you're making the system much more complicated and dangerous, you'd probably kill more animals than you'd save with this thing, to be honest, if you'd start spark gapping in and trying to. But the point is... 
for scientific and openness, there really is no limit to how far you want to expand upon it once you understand the concepts. But I just here want to show you the basic requirements to get this done and taking the new Maxwell interactions into considerations. And of course, there's only so much I can do myself, and I'm trying to experiment with this every day a little bit more. And as I have a little bit of concepts, and you know, you can't blame me for saying I never show anything. If you look in my past video, folks, there's a lot there that's surprising because it makes you think, you know, something that I found around the kitchen. You know, I have a way of finding everyday items to show devices. So I do a little bit of both, but you know, you got to give me a chance. We have the mathematical framework, we have the theory, we have the basic circuit diagrams now and understanding the inner workings. Now we just got to start building it. But everything is a process and I'm all alone here. So I hope that by sharing this information, other groups will get on it too and modify, enhance and develop these um, technologies. So with that said, folks, I will uh, wrap it up for now. I recommend that you download the PDF file because it really has a lot of explanations. And I'm always looking forward to your comments and suggestions. I know I made a form post on YouTube that I was going to talk about a new kind of power cell. Uh, I, just, I got into this here and it was fresh so I didn't want to lose it so I did this video right away. But yes, that was something I will um, explain a very new concept for power cells and I will get Hopefully by the next video, that's what it will be about. And of course, thank you all for your support. And please subscribe if you like. It really helps bring the word out and propagate through YouTube. And with that said, again, thank you very much and have all a nice day. Thank you.